Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to uh, give another lecture here. It's been almost two years since I've given a lecture uh, to the same forum. I would try to talk to you about um, what we do nowadays in cardiac uh, surgery, especially in coronary artery bypass graft surgery, and how we have improved uh, over the years, uh, and how the future is looking. Cardiac uh, coronary artery bypass graft surgery has got a very long history. Um, it started uh, almost 150 years ago, uh, and uh, the initial pace was very slow. It took uh, decades for its step to happen, up to the point where the hard lung machine um, was uh, invented. And from there and onwards, the steps have uh, progressed a little bit faster. And uh, if uh, we look to the first uh, um, coronary artery bypass graft that was performed in 1964, uh, and the first successful one in 67, within a year, we had 171 cases performed, and uh, last year in US alone, we had almost 400,000 coronary artery bypass graft surgery operations performed, and uh, we get into the millions of these kind of operations now every year worldwide. Uh, coronary artery disease um, is a very important uh, disease, affects 40, 3% of cardiac-related deaths. And uh, unlike the perception, the common perception um, that says that uh, say even women will die from breast cancer, that's not really true. It's uh, one in three women will probably die from heart disease and only one in 25 will die from uh, um, uh, breast cancer. And among most of us, uh, or some of us, I'm definitely around, uh, around the 40-year-old mark. Um, the trend is that at least half of uh, the males, so I've got 50% chance uh, to die of heart disease, and at least one in three females will, will suffer from severe coronary artery disease. It is um, interesting to see that the mortality from coronary artery disease has been decreasing over the years. And that, that is attributed 50% due to evidence-based medical therapies, uh, one of which is coronary bypass graft surgery. But the other 50% is from the changes that we impose into the major risk factors of coronary artery disease. Looking into the evidence base, we have learned over the last decade how to select our patients. And we know now, beyond any doubt, from the Syntax trial and the Freedom trial, that the coronary artery bypass graft surgery is the best way of addressing coronary artery disease, especially for patients with a high Syntax score, complex coronary artery disease, and probably for intermediate score as well. And definitely, and beyond any doubt, for diabetic patients. The major advantage that cabbage is giving over PCI to the patient is that uh, it has the ability to achieve a complete vascularization. It addresses all territories of the heart at the same time. And it doesn't only do that. It's got the ability to treat all proximal vulnerable plaques that could potentially develop into corporate re lesions over time. So it gives a benefit into the future. From now on, I'm going to be addressing <coughs> steps that we perform we do uh, before the surgery, during surgery, and after surgery. And all, each one of those steps has actually contributed into improved mortality and better outcome following cardiac surgery for coronary artery bypass. So we're looking into what we do, first of all, we do a coronary angiography. Um, but 
We have to bring in mind that coronary circulation is a three-dimensional structure. And uh, coronary angiogram is a two-dimensional picture. However, and despite the fact that coronary angiography is um, decades old, is still the gold standard method for assessing coronary circulation. So when we actually look into a coronary angiogram, we look into 2D moving picture, although each one of us, when we're assessing that, we think in 3D. But coronary angiography has also evolved, not by giving a better dye or having a, a better um, X-ray machine, but more because uh, it has added on extra things to it. And one of each most important one is uh, the FFR, which is the Fractional Flow Reserve Assessment. What it, that assessment gives you is uh, it gives you the, uh, it assesses the physiological significance of uh, the coronary artery disease. So what we usually do, we put a, a catheter down the coronary artery through the stenosis and we produce a hyperemia. And the, we address, we measure the pressure before and the pressure after, and we get a difference. When that difference is less than 75, then the sensitivity, the specificity of the, tech, of the test is exceptionally high. FFR with angiography can actually identify ischemia way below angina, ECG changes, systolic or diastolic function, dysfunction has occurred if it applied appropriately. So this is an example where we have a 75% stenosis in one coronary artery. So the blood that goes down this coronary artery is not significant to supply with oxygen and nutrients to a normal myocardium. So not enough blood going down to feed all this. So the FFR is less than 75, it's highly significant of 0.5. Now, if we have exactly the same lesion further down, but instead of having a full myocardium, we have half of it which is scarred, dead. There are no people living there, it's desert. Then, although we have the same percentage of significance, stenosis, to the proximal coronary artery, the blood that is going through that coronary artery and through that stenosis is sufficient to feed the remaining myocardium. So the FFR now is 0.84. So not significant. That's enough for this patient. So having used FFR and having used angiography, we now have learned that uh, a large proportion of our patients can be reclassified. And we know that about one in five severe stenosis will be FFR negative which means that even if you treat them, probably you wouldn't, make, you, wouldn't, it, you wouldn't have any effect, significant effect for this patient. However, we also know that one third of moderate stenosis will be FFR positive. And that's more to the point because this stenosis being significant, then may be left and probably will be left untreated. And as a pure number, one in five, of, one in five severe stenosis lesions are a lot less to one in three moderate stenosis. So there are a lot more patients at risk there. We move on into the assessment of coronary arteries with CT. The CT has evolved. We do CT angiograms now, and we can identify asymptomatic high-risk patients. The CT angiogram is highly accurate to exclude coronary artery disease. And we know that if we start scoring our patients with regards to the calcium score that they have on their coronary arteries, the higher the calcium score, the higher the incidence of coronary events. The CT angiography can be comparable to conventional angiography, especially for the proximal two thirds of the coronary arteries. We can see here that uh, the image from the CT and the image from the coronary angiogram are almost identical. What we also know is that it's what important 
the important is that the total coronary plaque burden, along with the number of plaques that the patient has, even if only one segment, segment of the heart is evolved, or even only one artery is evolved, are associated with an increased, increased risk of adverse outcome. And CT angiography helps us further. It helps us when we have a patient who already had coronary, coronary uh, bypass surgery and he comes for redo surgery. So it can tell us exactly where the coronaries lie and the patient can have a much safer operation. But also we use it as a tool in order to evaluate our post-operative graft patency. But we use other modalities as well. We use cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI is, uh, a, it becomes more and more important to us because uh, we can quantify viability and we can quantify scar. If you look to those pictures, what you can see is an area of myocardium which is thin around the septum and then it's got a very high gadolinium uptake, which means that that area is scarred, is dead. Now what we, over years, we managed to do is, is relate and qu the quantification of the scar to the outcome. And we know that uh, if uh, our scar in tissue is more than 50%, even if we revascularize this area, it does make any difference to the patient will probably expose them to a high risk operation with no additional benefit or procedure. It's also interesting to see that even patients who do not have much of scarring, which is this and that group here, there's still about 20 or 40% of the patients which they do not really get the benefit that we expect. And this is another interesting area of research that we currently undertake. Um, at our department. CMR also can give us an assessment of ischemia of the heart. It can tell us which part of the heart is actually not getting enough blood. And if we look to now into the same heart, starting from the apex and cutting it back towards the base, we can see these areas of black territory, which are the areas of ischemia. And these are correlating pretty well with the coronary angiography, which revealed three vessel disease, but 90% major stenosis to the circumflex and right coronary artery, which is the inferior and lateral wall of the heart. We also became a lot more sophisticated in addressing our patients. We have introduced pre-admission clinics, which are run by specialists, advanced nurse, lead clinicians, with a holistic approach to the patient needs and preoperative optimization of metabolic status, medications, additional investigations, and most importantly, interdisciplinary communication. So when the patient comes to us to have an operation, his act, most of his problems have been addressed to the best we can. Let's move now into what do we actually do different inside the operation, which is more of a, a direct surgical input. Cardiac operating theater is an area where advanced teamwork take, pre take presence. We have surgical teams, anesthetic teams, theater teams, imaging team, and perfusion team. All of these teams coming, coming together under that advanced teamwork and work as a unit. Inside theaters, we've learned, starting with uh, uh, the work that Professor Taggart uh, has done in the R trial, that uh, if we actually perform more and more bilateral internal mammary arteries and more arterial grafts, the patients actually uh, do better. And we know for sure that bilateral internal mammary arteries improve long-term survival after coronary, in, uh, after coronary artery bypass graft surgery in comparison to the single internal mammary artery, which has got a huge benefit by itself, with no study up until today showing any detrimental, serious detrimental effect by this process. A further meta-analysis actually quantifies and strengthens our data. 
And we know that it's not only the bilateral internal mammary arteries that we should be using more and more, but more and more arterial grafts. Having said that, if you actually look even to this graft, you can see that the number of single lima and long saphenous vein grafts has a huge, vast majority. So despite all this data, which hopefully gradually will creep in in the future, at present, over two thirds of patients will receive vein grafts. So vein grafts are very important to us. So we have to look after them. We have to understand them better. We have to treat them better and uh, we should get the maximum out of them. So what we do, we do endoscopic conduit harvesting, which is a practice, a common practice for 90, over 90% 90 of our cases here in Oxford as well over the past two years. The endoscopic conduit harvesting reduces the infection and good complications, the scarring, the pain, the time to ambulation, the length of stay, and the hospital readmissions for good care. And we have specialists who actually perform this part of the operation day in and day out. And this is, uh, uh, of course, uh, something that is recommended by NICE and all the guidelines today. And why? Because nobody wants whatever is on the right. It's obvious. Everybody wants what is on the left. It's a lot better for the patient. But after we've taken that vein out, we know that within 10 minutes, hardly any endothelial cells will be alive. Most of the endothelial cells will be dead within the first 10 minutes, even before we actually have time to put that vein onto the heart. And at present, we use saline or blood and saline-based solutions to preserve that conduit. However, as we move into the future, I think we should be looking into buffer solutions and solutions like Duragraft, which are solutions that they design to preserve heart for transplantations, and which can actually uh, uh, seem to preserve the endothelium for over five hours. So here in Oxford, we are in the process of evaluating the potential difference in changes between paired vein grafts for low-risk patients who undergo coronary artery bypass graft surgery in a prospective randomized double-blind uh, trial. But as we said, veins are very important to us. There are other things we can do for the veins, and one of them is the venous external stent. We think that the, this external support will prevent saphenous veins from dilating post-implantation. After all, they are veins, they are not arteries, they are not designed to sustain high pressures. It should reduce the diameter mismatch in between coronary targets, which are 1, 2, 2.5 millimeters in comparison to veins, which are usually 3, 4, 5, 6 millimeters in diameter. Reduce saphenous vein wall tension following exposure to arterial circulation and improve lumen uniformity and flow pattern, and ultimately mitigation of intima hyperplasia and occlusive thrombosis. Professor Tucker has uh, actually completed uh, the first RCT on the subject, which has been published this year. And we actually gone into the, in the VEST2 trial, which uh, uh, finished the all 30 patients and there's currently under review with their CT angiogram. And uh, we have moved into the VEST3 and 4 study now, with the first patient being recruited here in Oxford in October 2015. What does the VEST do? Quite simply, this is just a vein that is grafted to the right coronary artery. You can see that the vein is not uniform. It's got areas of dilatation, areas of narrowing, redilatation, re-narrowing, and that is within 12 months post-implantation. Look at this vein after a vest implantation, how uniform it is. If we look to the hemodynamics and the flow patterns, every single dilatation that we get, we get turbulence, we get more internal damage to the vein that's been going on every day, every minute of the patient's life. 
Look at this one. Look at the flow in a vested vein. How linear it is. Okay, we've implanted our arteries and we've done our veins. Do they work? Would you, any one of you accept to have a stent that's been deployed inside you and nobody has ever tested if it works or not? No. Unfortunately, quite a large number of cardiac surgical units that just perform bypasses without actually testing them to see if they work at the end of the operation. And we know that within the year, 20% of our veins will fail and 80% of arteries will fail. And we know that 10% of the grafts we perform and 10% of our patients will fail probably inside theater. So what we use here in Oxford is uh, what we call transient flow uh, time flowmetry and the epi uh, cardiac ultrasound, which we assess our patency of our grafts with. And these are recommended by most European guidelines and by NICE itself. How does it work? You use an ultrasound technology. It's a probe that measures flow, how much blood goes through. It measures a PI, but it's positivity index. It's nothing more than an inference of resistance. It gives you a backwards flow and gives you a diastolic flow percentage. And when we combine that with the ultrasound, then we can increase the sensitivity and specificity of this technique and the positive and negative predictive value. Let's see an example. This is what we measure. We put a normal graft, a Lima to LAD, and we're getting very good parameters, very good flow, with a, very, with a low PI and nice diastolic flow of 86%, perfect graft. This graft will last for years, decades. And then we put the ultrasound on it, and we can see the flow into the, from the Lima into the LAD. Perfect. Look at these two grafts. You can see here that the flow is minus one with a huge amount of resistance or one with, again, very high resistance. Leave these grafts without doing anything to them. It will go down by the time you close the chest. So this graft's been revised. And these are the flows. It's clear cut. We also use imaging inside theaters to help us with uh, the revascularization process. Look at the heart on the right before revascularization can hardly move. Look at the one on the left following administration of blood through coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Happy heart. Ultrasound can help us identify areas of regional water abnormalities, guide us through the process. <coughs> we also work on the cellular signaling level. We do studies, recruiting patients, and looking into a molecular or submolecular level. One of the biggest studies is the adiporetics where we recruit patients that go through cardiac surgery. We're imaging them before surgery and uh, we take uh, various samples for cellular and subcellular investigations. And then the patient leading to surgery, we, are, we the surgeons, have take a lot of samples from uh, various tissues, including fat and biopsies, and we run a number of tests to these patients. And we make sure that they have a very good in-hospital clinical outcome so they can be in a position to come be assessed with a CT angiogram and fat imaging at six weeks and five years with a view to follow them up for 10 years and hopefully complete recruitment by 2016 or 1,000 patients. We also have different techniques. We use pump, that is cardiopulmonary bypass. We do off-pump, we do hybrid. All these are techniques that now we know that we should use them appropriately and fit our patients to the technique rather than our technique to the patient. Unfortunately, we do not have hybrid theaters here yet, but hopefully within the years to come, we're gonna get a couple. With regards to robotic and minimally invasive surgery, still at its infancy, 
We don't do it here. There are only a few centers that do it around the globe as an everyday practice. And um, it needs a lot more work to actually get the penetration, a worldwide penetration. Finally, what do we do different after the patient had an operation? We need a better, we have a better anesthesia and not you management. It's, it's surprisingly how many people put effort in actually pushing one patient through the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative time. We're talking about tens of health professionals. And every single one of them is an important member of the team. We also have a better secondary prevention with appropriate and early antiplatelet therapy, with dual antiplatelets, and with better management of antiplatelet resistance. We understand better about the maximum effect of statins, beta blockers, as inhibitors. We optimize blood pressure management, diabetic management, and of course, try our best so our patients stop smoking following cardiac surgery. At this present time, there are a number of projects that take place in our department. And there are at least three PhDs that are running, with a, a lot more PhDs that have already been completed, and hopefully a lot more to run in the future. Here, I would like to thank you all for uh, coming today to listen to this talk. And uh, also, I would like to take the opportunity to thank David Taggart, Professor David Taggart, for his enormous contribution into the field of coronary artery bypass graft surgery in local, national, and international level. I think between David and myself, we should be able to attend all your potential questions. Thank you.